It was the day after Don Fair when my story commences. It had been a brisk market, several dealers had attended from the northern and midland counties in England, and English money had flown so merrily about as to gladden the hearts of the highland farmers. Many large droves were about to set off for England, under the protection of their owners or of the topsmen whom they employed in the tedious, laborious and responsible office of driving the cattle for many hundred miles from the markets where they had been purchased to the fields or farmyards where they were to be fattened for the shambles. The Highlanders, in particular, are masters of this difficult trade of driving, which seems to suit them as well as the trade of war. It affords exercise for all their habits of patient endurance and active exertion. They are required to know perfectly the drove roads, which lie over the wildest tracts of the country, and to avoid as much as possible the highways which distress the feet of the bullocks and the turnpikes which annoy the spirit of the drover. Whereas on the broad green or grey track which leads across the pathless moor, the herd not only move at ease and without taxation, but, if they mind their business, may pick up a mouthful of food by the way. At night the drovers usually sleep along with their cattle, let the weather be what it will, and many of these hardy men do not once rest under a roof during a journey on foot from the harbour to Lincolnshire. They are paid very highly, for the trust reposed is of the last importance, as it depends on their prudence, vigilance and honesty, whether the cattle reach the final market in good order and afford a profit to the grazier. But, as they maintain themselves at their own expense, they are especially economical in that particular. At the period we speak of, a highland drover was victualled for his long and toilsome journey with a few handfuls of oatmeal and two or three onions, renewed from time to time and a ram's horn filled with whisky, which he used regularly but sparingly every night and morning. His dirk, or skeen do, that is, black knife, so worn as to be concealed beneath the arm or by the folds of the plaid, was his only weapon, excepting the cudgel with which he directed the movements of the cattle. A highlander was never so happy as on these occasions. There was a variety in the whole journey which exercised the Celt's natural curiosity and love of motion. There were the constant change of place and scene, the petty adventures incidental to the traffic, and the intercourse with the various farmers, graziers and traders, intermingled with occasional merry-makings, not the less acceptable to Donald that they were void of expense. And there was the consciousness of superior skill, for the Highlander, a child amongst flocks, is a prince amongst herds and his natural habits induce him to disdain the shepherd's slothful life, so that he feels himself nowhere more at home than when following a gallant drove of his country castle in the character of their guardian. Of the number who left Doon in the morning, and with the purpose we have described, not a gloonomy of them all cocked his bonnet more briskly or gartered his tartan hose on their knee over a pair of more promising spigs, that is, legs, than did Robin Oig McCombick, called familiarly Robin Oig, that is, young, or the lesser Robin. Though small of stature, as the epithet Oig implies, and not very strongly limbed, he was as light and alert as one of the deer of his mountains. He had an elasticity of step which, in the course of a long march, made many a stout fellow envy him, and the manner in which he busked his plaid and adjusted his bonnet argued a consciousness that so smart a John Highland man as himself would not pass unnoticed among the lowland lasses. The ruddy cheek, red lips and white teeth set off a countenance which had gained by exposure to the weather a healthful and hardy rather than a rugged hue. If Robin Oig did not laugh or even smile frequently, as indeed is not the practice among his countrymen, his bright eyes usually gleamed from under his bonnet with an expression of cheerfulness ready to be turned into mirth. The departure of Robin Oig was an incident in the little town in and near which he had many friends, male and female. He was a topping person in his way, transacted considerable business on his own behalf, and was entrusted by the best farmers in the highlands in preference to any other drover in that district. He might have increased his business to any extent had he condescended to manage it by deputy. But except a lad or two, sisters' sons of his own, Robin rejected the idea of assistance, conscious, perhaps, how much his reputation depended upon his attending in person to the practical discharge of his duty in every instance. 
He remained, therefore, contented with the highest premium given to persons of his description, and comforted himself with the hopes that a few journeys to England might enable him to conduct business on his own account in a manner becoming his birth. For Robin Oig's father, Lachlan McCombick, or son of my friend, his actual clan surname being MacGregor, had been so called by the celebrated Rob Roy because of the particular friendship which had subsisted between the grandsire of Robin and that renowned Catherine. Some people even say that Robin Oig derived his Christian name from one as renowned in the wilds of Loch Lomond as ever was his namesake Robin Hood in the precincts of Mary Sherwood. Of such ancestry, as James Boswell says, who would not be proud? Robin Oig was proud accordingly. But his frequent visits to England and to the lowlands had given him tact enough to know that pretensions which still gave him a little right to distinction in his own lonely glen might be both obnoxious and ridiculous if preferred elsewhere. The pride of birth, therefore, was like the miser's treasure, the secret subject of his contemplation, but never exhibited to strangers as a subject of boasting. Many were the words of gratulation and good luck which were bestowed on Robin Oig. The judges commended his drove, especially Robin's own property, which were the best of them. Some thrust out their snuff mulls for the parting pinch, others tendered the jocondarach or parting cup. All cried, Good luck, travel out with you and come home with you. Give you luck in the Saxon market, brave notes in the lower do or black pocket book, and plenty of English fold in the sporran, that is, pouch of goat skin. The bonny lasses made their adieus more modestly and more than one, it was said, would have given her best brooch to be certain that it was upon her that his eye last rested as he turned towards the road. Robin Oig had just given the preliminary hoo-hoo to urge forward the loiterers of the drove when there was a cry behind him. Stay, Robin, by the blink. Here is Janet of Tomahurik, owl Janet, your father's sister. Plague on her for an owl highland witch and spaywife said a farmer from the cars of Stirling. She'll cast some of her cantrips on the cattle. She canna do that, said another sapient of the same profession. Robin Oig is no the lad to leave any of them without tying Sid Mungo's knot on their tails. And that will put to her speed the best witch that ever flew over Dimiet upon a broomstick. It may not be indifferent to the reader to know that the highland cattle are peculiarly liable to be taken or infected by spells and witchcraft, which judicious people guard against by knitting knots of peculiar complexity on the tuft of hair which terminates the animal's tail. But the old woman who was the object of the farmer's suspicion seemed only busied about the drover, without paying any attention to the drove. Robin, on the contrary, appeared rather impatient of her presence. "'What our world fancy,' he said, has brought you so early from the Ingleside this morning, Moom. I am sure I bid you good evening, and had your god speed last night. And left me more siller than the useless old woman will use till you come back again, bird of my bosom, said the Sibyl. But it is little I would care for the food that nourishes me, or the fire that warms me, or for God's blessed son itself, if aught but weal should happen to the grandson of my father. So let me walk the diesel round you, that you may go safe out into the far foreign land and come safe home. Robin Oig stopped, half embarrassed, half laughing, and signing to those around that he only complied with the old woman to soothe her humour. In the meantime, she traced around him with wavering steps the propitiation which some have thought has been derived from the druidical mythology. It consists, as is well known, in the person who makes the diesel, walking three times round the person who is the object of the ceremony, taking care to move according to the course of the sun. At once, however, she stopped short and exclaimed in a voice of alarm and horror, Grandson of my father, there is blood on your hand. Hush, for God's sake, aunt, said Robin Oig. You will bring more trouble on yourself with this tashitara. Second sight, then you will be able to get out of for many a day. The old woman only repeated with a ghastly look, There is blood on your hand, and it is English blood. The blood of the gale is richer and redder. Let us see, let us... Ere Robin Oig could prevent her, 
which indeed could only have been by positive violence, so hasty and peremptory were her proceedings, she had drawn from his side the dirk which lodged in the folds of his plaid and held it up, exclaiming, although the weapon gleamed clear and bright in the sun, Blood, blood, Saxon blood again! Robin Oig McCombick, go not this day to England! Tut, tut, answered Robin Oig, that will never do neither. It will be next thing to run in the country. For shame, Moom, give me the dirk. You canny tell by the colour the difference betwixt the blood of a black bullock and a white one, and you speak of knowing Saxon from Gaelic blood. All men have their blood for Madam Moom. Give me my skein do and let me go on my road. I should have been half way to Stirling Brig by this time. Give me my dirk and let me go. Never will I give it to you, said the old woman. Never will I quit my hold upon your plaid unless you promise me not to wear that unhappy weapon. The women around him urged him also saying few of his aunt's words fell to the ground, and as the lowland farmers continued to look moodily on the scene, Robin Oig determined to close it at any sacrifice. "'Well, then,' said the young drover, giving the scabbard of the weapon to Hugh Morrison, "'you lowlanders care nothing for these freets. Keep my dirk for me. I cannot give it you because it was my father's, but your drove follows ours, and I am content it should be in your keeping, not in mine. Will this do, Moom? It must, said the old woman. That is, if the lowlander is mad enough to carry the knife. The strong westland man laughed aloud. Ha ha, good wife, said he. I am Hugh Morrison from Glen A, come of the manly Morrisons of Auld Lang Syne, that never took short weapon against a man in their lives. And neither needed they, they had their broadswords, when I have this bit supple, showing a formidable cudgel. For Turkey or the board, I leave that to John Highland, man. You needn't snort none of you Highlanders, and you in especial, Robin. I'll keep the bit knife, if you are feared of the old spaywise tale, and give it back to you whenever you want it. Robin was not particularly pleased with some part of Hugh Morrison's speech, but he had learned in his travels more patience than belonged to his Highland constitution originally, and he accepted the service of the descendant of the manly Morrisons without finding fault with the rather deprecating manner in which it was offered. If he had not had his morning in his head, and been but a drum freeshire hog into the boot, he would have spoken more like a gentleman. But you cannot have more of a sow than a grump. It's shame my father's knife should ever slash a haggis for the like of him. Thus saying, but saying it in Gaelic, Robin drove on his cattle, and waved farewell to all behind him. He was in the greater haste because he expected to join at Falkirk a comrade and brother in profession with whom he proposed to travel in company. Robin Oig's chosen friend was a young Englishman, Harry Wakefield by name, well known at every northern market, and in his way as much famed and honoured as our highland driver of bullocks. He was nearly six feet high, gallantly formed to keep the rounds at Straithfield or maintain the ring at a wrestling match and although he might have been overmatched perhaps among the regular professors of the fancy, yet as a yokel or rustic or a chance customer he was able to give a bellyful to any amateur of the pugilistic art. Doncaster races saw him in his glory, betting his guinea and generally successfully. Nor was there a main fought in Yorkshire, the feeders being persons of celebrity, at which he was not to be seen if business permitted. But though a sprack lad and fond of pleasures and its haunts, Harry Wakefield was steady and not the cautious Robin Oig McCombick himself was more attentive to the main chance. His holidays were holidays indeed, but his days of work were dedicated to steady and persevering labour. In countenance and temper, Wakefield was the model of old England's merry yeomen whose cloth-yard shafts in so many hundred battles asserted her superiority over the nations, and whose good sabres in our own time are her cheapest and most assured defence. His mirth was readily excited, for, strong in limb and constitution, and fortunate in circumstances, he was disposed to be pleased with everything about him, and such difficulties as he might occasionally encounter were, to a man of his energy, rather matter of amusement than serious annoyance. With all the merits of a sanguine temper, our young English drover was not without his defects. He was irascible, sometimes to the verge of being quarrelsome, 
and perhaps not the less inclined to bring his disputes to a pugilistic decision because he found few antagonists able to stand up to him in the boxing ring. It is difficult to say how Harry Wakefield and Robin Oig first became intimates, but it is certain a close acquaintance had taken place betwixt them, although they had apparently few common subjects of conversation or of interest, so soon as their talk ceased to be of bullocks. Robin Oig, indeed, spoke the English language rather imperfectly upon any other topics but stots and kylos, and Harry Wakefield could never bring his broad Yorkshire tongue to utter a single word of Gaelic. It was in vain Robin spent a whole morning during a walk over Minch Moor in attempting to teach his companion to utter, with true precision, the shibboleth the who, which is the Gaelic for a calf. From Tarquar to Murder Cairn, the hill rung with the discordant attempts of the Saxon upon the unmanageable monosyllable and the heartfelt laugh which followed every failure. They had, however, better modes of awakening the echoes, for Wakefield could sing many a ditty to the praise of Moll, Susan and Sicily, and Robin Oig had a particular gift at whistling interminable pibrocks through all their involutions, and what was more agreeable to his companion's southern ear, knew many of the northern airs, both lively and pathetic, to which Wakefield learned to pipe a bass. Thus, though Robin Oig could have hardly comprehended his companion's stories about horse-racing and cock-fighting or fox-hunting, and although his own legends of clan-fights and creas varied with talk of highland goblins and fairy folk, would have been caviar to his companion, they contrived nevertheless to find a degree of pleasure in each other's company, which had for three years back induced them to join company and travel together, when the direction of their journey permitted. Each, indeed, found his advantage in this companionship, for where could the Englishman have found a guide through the western highlands like Robin Oig McCombick? And when they were on what Harry called the right side of the border, his patronage, which was extensive, and his purse, which was heavy, were at all times at the service of his highland friend. And on many occasions his liberality did him genuine yeoman's service. Were ever two such loving friends, how could they disagree? Oh, thus it was, he loved him dear, and thought how to requite him, and having no friend left but he, he did resolve to fight him, duke upon duke. The pair of friends had traversed with their usual cordiality the grassy wilds of Lidsdale, and crossed the opposite part of Cumberland emphatically called the Waste. In these solitary regions the cattle under the charge of our drovers derived their subsistence chiefly by picking their food as they went along the drove road, or sometimes by the tempting opportunity of a start and oar loop or invasion of the neighbouring pasture where an occasion presented itself. But now the scene changed before them. They were descending towards a fertile and enclosed country, where no such liberties could be taken with impunity or without previous arrangement and bargain with the possessors of the ground. This was more especially the case, as a great northern fair was upon the eve of taking place, where both the Scotch and the English drover expected to dispose of a part of their cattle, which it was desirable to produce in the market rested and in good order. Fields were therefore difficult to be obtained, and only upon high terms. This necessity occasioned a temporary separation betwixt the two friends who went to bargain, each as he could, for the separate accommodation of his herd. Unhappily it chanced that both of them, unknown to each other, thought of bargaining for the ground they wanted on the property of a country gentleman of some fortune, whose estate lay in the neighbourhood. The English drover applied to the bailiff on the property, who was known to him. It chanced that the Cumbrian squire, who had entertained some suspicions of his manager's honesty, was taking occasional measures to ascertain how far they were well founded, and had desired that any inquiries about his enclosures, with a view to occupy them for a temporary purpose, should be referred to himself. As, however, Mr. Ireby had gone the day before upon a journey of some miles' distance to the northward, the bailiff chose to consider the check upon his full powers as for the time removed, and concluded that he could best consult his master's interest and perhaps his own in making an agreement with Harry Wakefield. Meanwhile, ignorant of what his comrade was doing, Robin Oig, on his side, chanced to be overtaken by a good-looking, smart little man upon a pony, most knowingly hogged and cropped as was then the fashion, 
the rider wearing tight leather breeches and long-necked bright spurs. This cavalier asked one or two pertinent questions about markets and the price of stock. So Robin, seeing him a well-judging civil gentleman, took the freedom to ask him whether he could let him know if there was any grassland to be let in the neighbourhood for the temporary accommodation of his drove. He could not have put the question to more willing ears. The gentleman of the buckskins was the proprietor with whose bailiff Harry Wakefield had dealt or was in the act of dealing. "'Thou art in good luck, my canny Scot,' said Mr. Ireby, to have spoken to me. "'For I see thy cattle have done thy day's work, and I have at my disposal the only field within three miles that is to be let in these parts. "'The drove can be gang two, three, four miles very pretty well indeed,' said the cautious Highlander. "'But what would his honour be asking for the beasts be the head, if she was to take the park for two or three days?' "'We won't differ, Sonny, if you let me have six stots for winterers, in the way of reason.' And which beasts would your honour be for having? Why, let me see. The two black, the dun one, yon doddy, him with the twisted horn, the brocket. How much by the head? Ah, said Robin, your honour is a judge, a real judge. I couldn't have set off the best six beasts better myself, me that ken em as if they were my bairns, poor things. Well, how much per head, Sawney? continued Mr. Ireby. It was high markets at Doon and Falkirk, answered Robin. And thus the conversation proceeded until they had agreed on the pre-just for the bullocks, the squire throwing in the temporary accommodation of the enclosure for the cattle into the boot, and Robin making, as he thought, a very good bargain, provided the grass was but tolerable. The squire walked his pony alongside of the drove, partly to show him the way and see him put into possession of the field and partly to learn the latest news of the northern markets. They arrived at the field, and the pasture seemed excellent. But what was their surprise when they saw the bailiff quietly inducting the cattle of Harry Wakefield into the grassy Goshen which had just been assigned to those of Robin Oig McCombick by the proprietor himself? Squire Ireby set spurs to his horse, dashed up up to his servant, and learning what had passed between the parties, briefly informed the English drover that his bailiff had let the ground without his authority, and that he might seek grass for his cattle wherever he would, since he was to get none there. At the same time he rebuked his servant severely for having transgressed his commands, and ordered him instantly to assist in ejecting the hungry and weary cattle of Harry Wakefield, who were just beginning to enjoy a meal of unusual plenty, and to introduce those of his comrade whom the English drover now began to consider as a rival. The feelings which arose in Wakefield's mind would have induced him to resist Mr. Ireby's decision, but every Englishman has a tolerably accurate sense of law and justice, and John Fleecebumpkin, the bailiff, having acknowledged that he had exceeded his commission, Wakefield saw nothing else for it than to collect his hungry and disappointed charge and drive them on to seek quarters elsewhere. Robin Oig saw what had happened with regret and hastened to offer his English friend to share with him the disputed possession. But Wakefield's pride was severely hurt and he answered disdainfully, Take it all, man, take it all. Never make two bites of a cherry. Thou canst talk over the gentry and blear a plain man's eye. Out upon you, man. I would not kiss any man's dirty latchets for leave to bake in his oven. Robin Oig, sorry but not surprised at his comrade's displeasure, hastened to entreat his friend to wait but an hour till he had gone to the squire's house to receive payment for the cattle he had sold, and he would come back and help him to drive the cattle into some convenient place of rest, and explain to him the whole mistake they had both of them fallen into. But the Englishman continued indignant. Thou hast been selling, hast thou? Ay, ay, thou was a cunning lad for kenning the hours of bargaining. Go to the devil with thyself, for I will ne'er see thy false loon's visage again. Thou should be ashamed to look me in the face. I am ashamed to look no man in the face, said Robin Oig, something moved. And moreover, I will look you in the face this blessed day, if you abide at the clochan down yonder. Mayhap you would as well keep away, said his comrade, and turning his back on his former friend, he collected his unwilling associates, assisted by the bailiff, who took some real and some affected interest in seeing Wakefield accommodated. After spending some time in negotiating with more than one of the neighbouring farmers, 
who could not, or would not, afford the accommodation desired, Harry Wakefield, at last, and in his necessity, accomplished his point by means of the landlord of the alehouse, at which Robin Oig and he had agreed to pass the night when they first separated from each other. Mine host was content to let him turn his cattle on a piece of barren moor, at a price little less than the bailiff had asked for the disputed enclosure and the wretchedness of the pasture, as well as the price paid for it, were set down as exaggerations of the breach of faith and friendship of his Scottish crony. This turn of Wakefield's passions was encouraged by the bailiff, who had his own reasons for being offended against poor Robin, as having been the unwitting cause of his falling into disgrace with his master, as well as by the innkeeper and two or three chance guests, who stimulated the drover in his resentment against his quondam associate some from the ancient grudge against the Scots, which, when it exists anywhere, is to be found lurking in the border counties, and some from the general love of mischief, which characterises mankind in all ranks of life, to the honour of Adam's children be it spoken. Good John Barleycorn also, who always heightens and exaggerates the prevailing passions, be they angry or kindly, was not wanting in his offices on this occasion and confusion to false friends and hard masters was pledged in more than one tankard. In the meanwhile, Mr. Ireby found some amusement in detaining the northern drover at his ancient hall. He caused the cold round of beef to be placed before the Scot in the butler's pantry, together with a foaming tankard of home-brewed, and took pleasure in seeing the hearty appetite with which these unwonted edibles were discussed by Robin Oig McCombick. The squire himself, lighting his pipe, compounded between his patrician dignity and his love of agricultural gossip, by walking up and down while he conversed with his guest. "'I passed another drove,' said the squire, "'with one of your countrymen behind them. There were something less beasts than your drove. Doddies, most of them. A big man was with them. None of your kilts, though, but a decent pair of breeches. Do you know who he may be?' "'What? Oh, die. That might, could, and would be Huey Morrison. I didn't think he would have been so well up. He has made a day on us, but his Argyle shires will have wearied shanks. How far was he behind? I think about six or seven miles, answered the squire, for I passed them at Christenbury Crag, and I overtook you at the Holland Bush. If his beasts be leg-weary, he will be maybe selling bargains. Now, now, Huey Morrison is no the man for bargains. Ye mun come to some highland body like Robin Oak herself for the like o' these. But I mun be wishing ye good night, and twenty of them, let alone one. And I mun down to the clochan to see if the lad Harry Wackfelt is out of his hum dudgeons yet. The party at the alehouse were still in full talk, and the treachery of Robin Oig still the theme of conversation when the supposed culprit entered the apartment. His arrival, as usually happens in such a case, put an instant stop to the discussion of which he had furnished the subject, and he was received by the company assembled with that chilling silence which, more than a thousand exclamations, tells an intruder that he is unwelcome. Surprised and offended, but not appalled by the reception which he experienced, Robin entered with an undaunted and even a haughty air, attempted no greeting, as he saw he was received with none, and placed himself by the side of the fire, a little apart from a table at which Harry Wakefield, the bailiff, and two or three other persons were seated. The ample Cumbrian kitchen would have afforded plenty of room, even for a larger separation. Robin, thus seated, proceeded to light his pipe and call for a pint of tuppenny. "'We have no tuppence ale,' answered Ralph Heskett, the landlord. "'But as thou find'st thy own tobacco, it's like thou mayst find thy own liquor, too. It's the wont of thy country, I wot.' "'Shame, good man,' said the landlady, a blithe, bustling housewife, hastening herself to supply the guest with liquor. "'Thou knowest well and now what the strange man wants, and it's thy trade to be civil man. Thou shouldst know that if the Scot likes a small pot, he pays a sure penny.' Without taking any notice of this nuptial dialogue, the Highlander took the flagon in his hand, and addressing the company generally, drank the interesting toast of good markets to the party assembled. "'The better that the wind blew fewer dealers from the north,' said one of the farmers, "'and fewer highland runts to eat up the English meadows.' "'Soul of my body, but you are wrong there, my friend,' answered Robin with composure. 
It's your fat Englishmen that eat up our Scots cattle, poor things. I wish there was some to eat up their drovers, said another. A plain Englishman canna make bread with a kennin of them. Or an honest servant keep his master's favour, but they will come sliding in between him and the sunshine, said the bailiff. If these be jokes, said Robin Oig, with the same composure, there is o'er many jokes upon one man. It's no joke, but downright earnest, said the bailiff. Harky, Mr. Robin Og, or whatever is your name, it's right we should tell you that we are all of one opinion, and that is that you, Mr. Robin Og, have behaved to our friend Mr. Harry Wakefield here like a raff and a blackguard. Nay doubt, nay doubt, answered Robin with great composure, and you are a set of very pretty judges, for whose brains or behaviour I would not gi a pinch of sneezing. If Mr. Harry Wakefield kens where he is wronged, he kens where he may be righted. He speaks truth, said Wakefield, who had listened to what had passed, divided between the offence which he had taken at Robin's late behaviour and the revival of his habitual feelings of regard. He now rose and went towards Robin, who got up from his seat as he approached and held out his hand. That's right, Harry, go it, serve him out, resounded on all sides. Tip him the nailer, show him the mill. Hold your peace, all of you, and be, said Wakefield and then addressing his comrade, took him by the extended hand with something alike of respect and defiance. Robin, he said, thou hast used me ill enough this day, but if you mean, like a frank fellow, to shake hands and take a tussle for love on the sod, why, I forgive thee, man, and we shall be better friends than ever. And would it no be better to be good friends without more of the matter? said Robin. We will be much better friendships with our pains hailed than broken. Harry Wakefield dropped the hand of his friend, or rather threw it from him. I did not think I had been keeping company for three years with a coward. Coward belongs to none of my name, said Robin, whose eyes began to kindle, but keeping the command of his temper. It was no coward's legs or hands, Harry Wakefield, that drew you out of the fords of Frew when you was drifted o'er the black rock, and every eel in the river expected a share of you. And that is true enough, too said the Englishman, struck by the appeal. "'Dad zooks!' exclaimed the bailiff. "'Sure Harry Wakefield, the nattiest lad at Whitson, Treast, Wooler Fair, Carlisle Sands, or Stagshaw Bank, is not going to show the white feather. <laughs> this comes of living so long with kilts and bonnets. Men forget the use of their daddies.' "'I may teach you, Master Fleecebumpkin, that I have not lost the use of mine,' said Wakefield, and then went on. This will never do, Robin. We must have a turn-up, or we shall be the talk of the countryside. I'll be damned if I hurt thee. I'll put on the gloves, gin thou like. Come, stand forward like a man. To be beaten like a dog, said Robin. Is there any reason in that? If you think I have done you wrong, I'll go before your judge, though I neither know his law nor his language. A general cry of, No, no, no law, no lawyer. A bellyful and be friends was echoed by the bystanders. But, continued Robin, if I am to fight, I have no skill to fight like a jack in apes with hands and nails. How would you fight, then? said his antagonist, though I am thinking it would be hard to bring you to the scratch anyhow. I would fight with broadswords and sink point on the first blood drawn like a gentleman's. A loud shout of laughter followed the proposal which indeed had rather escaped from poor Robin's swelling heart than had been the dictate of a sober judgment. "'Gentlemen, quotha!' was echoed on all sides with a shout of unextinguishable laughter. "'Very pretty, gentlemen, God what? Can't get two swords for the gentleman to fight with, Ralph Heskett?' "'No, but I can send to the armory at Carlisle and lend them two forks to be making shift with in the meantime.' "'Tush, man,' said another. The bonny Scots come into the world with a blue bonnet on their heads, a dark and pistol at their belt. Best send post, said Mr. Fleece Bumpkin, <laughs> to the squire of Corby Castle to come and stand second to the gentleman. In the midst of this torrent of general ridicule, the Highlander instinctively gripped beneath the folds of his plaid. But it is better not, he said in his own language, a hundred curses on the swine-eaters who know neither decency nor civility. Make room, the pack of you, he said, advancing to the door. 
But his former friend interposed his sturdy bulk and opposed his leaving the house. And when Robin Oig attempted to make his way by force, he hit him down on the floor with as much ease as a boy bowls down a ninepin. A ring! A ring! was now shouted until the dark rafters and the hams that hung on them trembled again and the very platters on the bink clattered against each other. Well done, Harry. Give it him home, Harry. Take care of him now. He sees his own blood. Such were the exclamations, while the Highlander, starting from the ground, all his coldness and caution lost in frantic rage, sprung at his antagonist with the fury, the activity, and the vindictive purpose of an incensed tiger-cat. But when could rage encounter science and temper? Robin Oig again went down in the unequal contest, and as the blow was necessarily a severe one, he lay motionless on the floor of the kitchen. The landlady ran to offer some aid, but Mr. Fleecebumpkin would not permit her to approach. Let him alone, he said. He'll come too within time. He has not got half his broth yet. He has got all I mean to give him, though, said his antagonist, whose heart began to relent towards his old associate. I would rather by half give the rest to yourself, Mr. Fleecebumpkin, for you pretend to know a thing or two, and Robin had not art enough even to peel before setting to, but fought with his plaid dangling about him. Stand up, Robin, my man, all friends now, and let me hear the man that will speak a word against you or your country for your sake. Robin Oig was still under the domination of his passion and eager to renew the onset, but being withheld on the one side by the peacemaking Dame Heskett, and on the other, aware that Wakefield no longer meant to renew the combat, his fury sunk into gloomy sullenness. Come, come, never grudge so much at it, man, said the brave-spirited Englishman with the placability of his country. Shake hands, and we will be better friends than ever. Friends, exclaimed Robin Oig with strong emphasis. Friends, never. Look to yourself, Harry Wackfelt. Then the curse of Cromwell on your proud Scots stomach as the man says in the play, and you may do your worst and be damned, for one man can say nothing more to another after a tussle than that he is sorry for it. On these terms the friends parted. Robin Oig drew out in silence a piece of money, threw it on the table, and then left the alehouse. But turning at the door, he shook his hand at Wakefield, pointing with his forefinger upwards, in a manner which might imply either a threat or a caution. He then disappeared in the moonlight. Some words passed after his departure between the bailiff, who piqued himself on being a little of a bully, and Harry Wakefield, who, with generous inconsistency, was now not indisposed to begin a new combat in defence of Robin Oig's reputation, although he could not use his daddies like an Englishman, as it did not come natural to him. But Dame Heskett prevented this second quarrel from coming to a head by her peremptory interference. There should be no more fighting in her house she said. There had been too much already. And you, Mr. Wakefield, may live to learn, she added, what it is to make a deadly enemy out of a good friend. Poor dame. Robin Oig is an honest fellow and will never keep malice. Do not trust to that. You do not know the dour temper of the Scots, though you have dealt with them so often. I have a right to know them, my mother being a Scot. And so is well seen on her daughter, said Ralph Heskett. This nuptial sarcasm gave the discourse another turn. Fresh customers entered the taproom or kitchen, and others left it. The conversation turned on the expected markets, and the reports of prices from different parts both of Scotland and England. Treaties were commenced, and Harry Wakefield was lucky enough to find a chap for part of his drove, at a very considerable profit, an event of consequence more than sufficient to blot out all remembrances of the unpleasant scuffle in the earlier part of the day. But there remained one party from whose mind that recollection could not have been wiped away by the possession of every head of cattle betwixt Esk and Eden. This was Robin Oig McCombick. That I should have had no weapon, he said, and for the first time in my life, blighted be the tongue that bids the Highlander part with the dark. The dark, eh? The English blood, my moom's word, when did her word fall to the ground? The recollection of the fatal prophecy confirmed the deadly intention which instantly sprang up in his mind. Ah, Morrison cannot be many miles behind, and if it were an hundred, what then? His impetuous spirit had now a fixed purpose and motive of action. 
and he turned the light foot of his country towards the wilds, through which he knew by Mr. Ireby's report that Morrison was advancing. His mind was wholly engrossed by the sense of injury, injury sustained from a friend, and by the desire of vengeance on one whom he now accounted his most bitter enemy. The treasured ideas of self-importance and self-opinion, of ideal birth and quality, had become more precious to him, like the hoard to the miser, because he could only enjoy them in secret. But that hoard was pillaged. The idols which he had secretly worshipped had been desecrated and profane. Insulted, abused and beaten, he was no longer worthy, in his own opinion, of the name he bore or the lineage which he belonged to. Nothing was left to him, nothing but revenge. And, as the reflection added a galling spur to every step, he determined it should be as sudden and signal as the offence. When Robin Oig left the door of the alehouse, seven or eight English miles at least lay betwixt Morrison and him. The advance of the former was slow, limited by the sluggish pace of his cattle. The last left behind him stubble-field and hedgerow, crag and dark heath, all glittering with frost-rime in the broad November moonlight at the rate of six miles an hour. And now the distant lowing of Morrison's cattle is heard, and now they are seen creeping like moles in size and slowness of motion on the broad face of the moor. And now he meets them, passes them, and stops their conductor. "'May good be tied us, said the Southlander. "'Is it you, Robin McCombick, or your wraith?' "'It is Robin Oig McCombick,' answered the Highlander. "'And it is not. But never mind that. But be given me the skeen do. "'What? Are you far back to the Highlands? "'The devil! Have yon sell off all before the fair? "'This beats all for quick markets. "'I have not sold. I am not going north. "'Maybe I will never go north again. "'Give me back my dirk, Hugh Morrison, "'or there will be words between us. "'Indeed, Robin, I'll be better advised before I give it back to you. "'It is a one chancy weapon in a highland man's hand, "'and I am thinking you will be about some barns breaking. "'Tut, tut, let me have my weapon.' said Robin Oig impatiently. "'Holy and fairly,' said his well-meaning friend, "'I'll tell you what will do better than these ducking doings. Ye ken Highlander and Lowlander and border men are all a man's bairns when you're over the Scots dyke. See the Eskdale clants and fighting Charlie of Lissadell and the Lockerby lads and the four dandies of Lustruther and a wean mere grey plaids are coming up behind. And if you are wronged, there is the hand of a manly Morrison.' We'll see you right it if Carlyle and Stanwix baith took up the feud. To tell you the truth, said Robin Oig, desirous of eluding the suspicions of his friend, I have enlisted with a party of the Black Watch, and must march off to-morrow morning. Enlisted? Were you mad or drunk? You must buy yourself off. I can lend you twenty notes and twenty to that, if the droves sell. I thank you, thank you, Huey. But I go with good will to the gate that I am going— so the dark, the dark. There it is for you, then, since less wunna serve. But think on what I was saying. Ways me, it'll be sair news for the braes of Balquither that Robin Oig McCombick should a run an ill gate and taken on. Ill news in Balquither, indeed, echoed poor Robin. But God speech you, Huey, and send you good markets. Ye winna meet with Robin Oig again, either at Triest or Fair. So saying, he shook hastily the hand of his acquaintance and set out in the direction from which he had advanced with the spirit of his former pace. "'There's something wrong with the lad,' muttered the Morrison to himself. "'But we will maybe see better into it in the morn's morning.' But long ere the morning dawned, the catastrophe of our tale had taken place. It was two hours after the affray had happened, and it was totally forgotten by almost everyone when Robin Oig returned to Heskett's Inn. The place was filled at once by various sorts of men with noises corresponding to their character. There were the grave low sounds of men engaged in busy traffic, with the tough, the song and the riotous jests of those who had nothing to do but to enjoy themselves. Among the last was Harry Wakefield, who, amidst a grinning group of smock-frocks, hobnailed shoes and jolly English physiognomies, was trolling forth the old ditty what though my name be Roger, who drives the plough and cart? When he was interrupted by a well-known voice saying in a high and stern voice, marked by the sharp Highland accent, Harry Wackfelt, if you be a man, stand up. What is the matter? 
What is it? The guests demanded of each other. It's only a damned Scotsman, said Fleece Bumpkin, who was by this time very drunk, whom Harry Wakefield helped to his broth today, who is now come to have his cowled kale het again. Harry Wakefield, repeated the same ominous summons. Stand up, if you be a man. There is something in the tone of deep and concentrated passion which attracts attention and imposes awe, even by the very sound. The guests shrunk back on every side and gazed at the Highlander as he stood in the middle of them, his brows bent and his features rigid with resolution. I will stand up with all my heart, Robin, my boy, but it shall be to shake hands with you and drink down all unkindness. It is not the fault of your heart, man, that you don't know how to clench your hands. By this time he stood opposite to his antagonist, his open and unsuspecting look strangely contrasted with the stern purpose which gleamed wild, dark, and vindictive in the eyes of the Highlander. "'Tis not thy fault, man, that not having the luck to be an Englishman, thou canst not fight more than a schoolgirl." "'I can fight,' answered Robin Oig, sternly but calmly, "'and you shall know it. You, Harry Wackfelt, showed me today how the Saxon churls fight. I show you now how the Highland Dunny Wassel fights." He seconded the word with the action and plunged the dagger, which he suddenly displayed, into the broad chest of the English yeoman with such fatal certainty and force that the hilt made a hollow sound against the breastbone and the double-edged point split the very heart of his victim. Harry Wakefield fell and expired with a single groan. His assassin next seized the bailiff by the collar and offered the bloody poniard to his throat whilst dread and surprise rendered the man incapable of defence. "'It were very just to lay you beside him,' he said, "'but the blood of a base pickthank shall never mix on my father's dirk with that of a brave man.' As he spoke he cast the man from him with so much force that he fell on the floor, while Robin, with his other hand, threw the fatal weapon into the blazing turf-fire. "'There,' he said, "'take me who likes, and let fire cleanse blood if it can.' The cause of astonishment still continuing, Robin Oig asked for a peace officer, and a constable having stepped out, he surrendered himself to his custody. A bloody night's work you have made of it, said the constable. Your own fault, said the Highlander. Had you kept his hands off me two hours since, he would have been now as well and merry as he was two minutes since. It must be sorely answered, said the peace officer. Never do you mind that. Death pays all debts. It will pay that, too. The horror of the bystanders began now to give way to indignation, and the sight of a favourite companion murdered in the midst of them, the provocation being, in their opinion, so utterly inadequate to the excess of vengeance, might have induced them to kill the perpetrator of the deed even upon the very spot. The constable, however, did his duty on this occasion, and with the assistance of some of the more reasonable persons present, procured horses to guard the prisoner to Carlisle, to abide his doom at the next assizes. While the escort was preparing, the prisoner neither expressed the least interest nor attempted the slightest reply. Only before he was carried from the fatal apartment, he desired to look at the dead body which, raised from the floor, had been deposited upon the large table at the head of which Harry Wakefield had presided but a few minutes before, full of life, vigour and animation, until the surgeon should examine the mortal wound. The face of the corpse was decently covered with a napkin. To the surprise and horror of the bystanders, which displayed itself in a general, ah, <sighs> drawn through clenched teeth and half-shut lips, Robin Oig removed the cloth and gazed with a mournful but steady eye on the lifeless visage which had been so lately animated that the smile of good-humoured confidence in his own strength of conciliation at once and contempt towards his enemy, still curled his lip. While those present expected that the wound, which had so lately flooded the apartment with gore, would send forth fresh streams at the touch of the homicide, Robin Oig replaced the covering with a brief exclamation, He was a pretty man. My story is nearly ended. The unfortunate Highlander stood his trial at Carlisle. I was myself present, and as a young Scottish lawyer, or barrister at least, and reputed a man of some quality, the politeness of the Sheriff of Cumberland offered me a place on the bench. 
the facts of the case were proved in the manner I have related them. And whatever might be at first the prejudice of the audience against a crime so un-English as that of assassination from revenge, yet when the rooted national prejudices of the prisoner had been explained, which made him consider himself as stained with indelible dishonour when subjected to personal violence, when his previous patience, moderation and endurance were considered, the generosity of the English audience was inclined to regard his crime as the wayward aberration of a false idea of honour rather than as flowing from a heart naturally savage or perverted by habitual vice. I shall never forget the charge of the venerable judge to the jury, although not at that time liable to be much affected either by that which was eloquent or pathetic. We have had, he said, in the previous part of our duty, alluding to some former trials, to discuss crimes which in fair disgust and abhorrence while they call down the well-merited vengeance of the law. It is now our still more melancholy task to apply its salutary, though severe enactments, to a case of a very singular character, in which the crime, for crime it is, and a deep one, arose less out of the malevolence of the heart than the error of the understanding, less from any idea of committing wrong than from an unhappily perverted notion of that which is right. Here we have two men, highly esteemed, it has been stated, in their rank of life, and attached, it seems, to each other as friends, one of whose lives has been already sacrificed to a punctilio, and the other is about to prove the vengeance of the offended laws, and yet both may claim our commiseration at least, as men acting in ignorance of each other's national prejudices, and unhappily misguided rather than voluntarily erring from the path of right conduct. In the original cause of the misunderstanding, we must in justice give the right to the prisoner at the bar. He had acquired possession of the enclosure which was the object of competition by a legal contract with the proprietor, Mr. Irobey, and yet, when accosted with reproaches undeserved in themselves, and galling doubtless to a temper at least sufficiently susceptible of passion, he offered, notwithstanding, to yield up half his acquisition for the sake of peace and good neighbourhood, and his amicable proposal was rejected with scorn. Then follows the scene at Mr. Heskett, the publican's, and you will observe how the stranger was treated by the deceased, and, I am sorry to observe, by those around, who seemed to have urged him in a manner which was aggravating in the highest degree. While he asked for peace and composition, and offered submission to a magistrate or to a mutual arbiter, the prisoner was insulted by the whole company, who seem on this occasion to have forgotten the national maxim of fair play, and while attempting to escape from the place in peace, he was intercepted, struck down, and beaten to the effusion of his blood. Gentlemen of the jury, it was with some impatience that I heard my learned brother, who opened the case for the Crown, give an unfavourable turn to the prisoner's conduct on this occasion. He said the prisoner was afraid to encounter his antagonist in fair fight, or to submit to the laws of the ring, and that, therefore, like a cowardly Italian, he had recourse to his fatal stiletto, to murder the man whom he dared not meet in manly encounter. I observed the prisoner shrink from this part of the accusation with the abhorrence natural to a brave man. And as I would wish to make my words impressive when I point his real crime, I must secure his opinion of my impartiality by rebutting everything that seems to me a false accusation. There can be no doubt that the prisoner is a man of resolution, too much resolution. I wish to heaven that he had less, or rather that he had had a better education to regulate it. Gentlemen, as to the laws my brother talks of, they may be known in the bull ring or the bear garden or the cockpit, but they are not known here, or if they should be so far admitted as furnishing a species of proof that no malice was intended in this sort of combat, from which fatal accidents do sometimes arise, it can only be admitted when both parties are in part casu, equally acquainted with, and equally willing to refer themselves to that species of arbitrament. But it will be contended that a man of superior rank and education is to be subjected, or is obliged to subject himself, to this course of brutal strife, perhaps in opposition to a younger, stronger, or more skilful opponent? Certainly even the pugilistic code, if founded upon the fair play of merry old England, as my brother alleges it to be, can contain nothing so preposterous. And, gentlemen of the jury, if the laws support an English gentleman, 
wearing, we will suppose, his sword in defending himself by force against the violent personal aggression of the nature offered to this prisoner, they will not less protect a foreigner and a stranger involved in the same unpleasing circumstances. If, therefore, gentlemen of the jury, when thus pressed by a vis major, the object of obloquy to a whole company, and of direct violence from one at least, and, as he might reasonably apprehend, from more, the panel had produced the weapon which his countrymen, as we are informed, generally carry about their persons, and the same unhappy circumstance had ensued which you have heard detailed in evidence, I could not in my conscience have asked you to form a verdict of murder. The prisoner's personal defence might indeed, even in that case, have gone more or less beyond the modremen in culpite tutelar spoken of by lawyers, but the punishment incurred would have been that of manslaughter, not of murder. I beg leave to add that I should have thought this milder species of charge was demanded in the case supposed, notwithstanding the statute of James I, Cap 8, which takes the case of slaughter by stabbing with a short weapon, even without malice prepense, out of the benefit of clergy. For this statute of stabbing, as it is termed, arose out of a temporary cause, and as the real guilt is the same, whether the slaughter be committed by the dagger or by sword or pistol, the benignity of the modern law places them all on the same, or nearly the same, footing. But, gentlemen of the jury, the pinch of the case lies in the interval of two hours interposed betwixt the reception of the injury and the fatal retaliation. In the heat of a fray and shod melee, law, compassionating the infirmities of humanity, makes allowance for the passions which rule such a stormy moment, for the sense of present pain, for the apprehension of further injury, for the difficulty of ascertaining with due accuracy the precise degree of violence which is necessary to protect the person of the individual, without annoying or injuring the assailant more than is absolutely necessary. But the time necessary to walk twelve miles, however speedily performed, was an interval sufficient for the prisoner to have recollected himself, and the violence with which he carried his purpose into effect, with so many circumstances of deliberate determination, could neither be induced by the passion of anger nor that of fear. It was the purpose and the act of predetermined revenge, for which law neither can, will, nor ought to have any sympathy or allowance. It is true, we may repeat to ourselves, in alleviation of this poor man's unhappy action, that his case is a very peculiar one. The country which he inhabits was, in the days of many now alive, inaccessible to the laws not only of England, which have not even yet penetrated thither, but to those to which our neighbours of Scotland are subjected and which must be supposed to be, and no doubt actually are, founded upon the general principles of justice and equity which pervade every civilised country. Amongst their mountains, as among the North American Indians, the various tribes were wont to make war upon each other, so that each man was obliged to go armed for his own protection. These men, from the ideas which they entertained of their own descent and of their own consequence, regarded themselves as so many cavaliers or men-at-arms rather than as the peasantry of a peaceful country. Those laws of the ring, as my brother terms them, were unknown to a race of warlike mountaineers. That decision of quarrels by no other weapons than those which nature has given every man must to them have seemed as vulgar and preposterous as to the noblesse of France. Revenge, on the other hand, must have been as familiar to their habits of society as to those of the Cherokees or Mohawks. It is indeed, as described by Bacon, at bottom a kind of wild, untutored justice, for the fear of retaliation must withhold the hands of the oppressor where there is no regular law to check daring violence. But although this may be granted, and though we may allow that, such having been the case of the highlands in the days of the prisoners' fathers, many of the opinions and sentiments must still continue to influence the present generation, it cannot and ought not, even in this most painful case, to alter the administration of the law, either in your hands, gentlemen of the jury, or in mine. The first object of civilization is to place the general protection of the law, equally administered, in the room of that wild justice which every man cut and carved for himself, according to the length of his sword and the strength of his arm. The law says to the subjects, with a voice only inferior to that of the deity, Vengeance is mine. The instant that there is time for passion to cool and reason to interpose, 
an injured party must become aware that the law assumes the exclusive cognizance of the right and wrong betwixt the parties and opposes her inviolable buckler to every attempt of the private party to right himself. I repeat that this unhappy man ought personally to be the object rather of our pity than our abhorrence, for he failed in his ignorance and from mistaken notions of honour. But his crime is none the less that of murder, gentlemen, and in your high and important office it is your duty so to find. Englishmen have their angry passions as well as Scots, and should this man's actions remain unpunished, you may unsheath, under various pretenses, a thousand daggers betwixt the land's end and the Orkneys. The venerable judge thus ended what, to judge by his apparent emotion, and by the tears which filled his eyes, was really a painful task. The jury, according to his instructions, brought in a verdict of guilty, and Robin Oig McCombick, alias MacGregor, was sentenced to death, and left for execution which took place accordingly. He met his fate with great firmness, and acknowledged the justice of his sentence. But he repelled indignantly the observations of those who accused him of attacking an unarmed man. I give a life for the life I took, he said, and what can I do more?